the days I was there, my was kind of paid for free. So that's like the next two days, you know, the hell. You're there like all day. Oh. You have to be. Oh. You know, oh. you know, I'm Kate Keene. Some of you might have seen me yesterday talk about culture and security. But in my real day job, I actually do run a cybersecurity artificial intelligence company. And being a theater and poli sci major in college, it's kind of shocking that I would actually take this long road and run an AI company. So when John and I talked, one thing I've been working on is thinking about how, as a culture, are we thinking about artificial intelligence? And how, as security professionals, can we actually do more to improve humankind? So let me tell you a little bit about my story with AI, because it's an interesting and long road. I have been working or participating in artificial intelligence from a technology perspective since I was 10 years old. And there's two little girls in the back room, Kyle and Callan, can you wave, it's fun. Yeah, right there. Those are my 11 year olds, so if you think about it, I have been in artificial intelligence since their age. Now why? Well, when I was 10 years old, my father was driving down the highway, hit a patch of ice, had a car accident, and we hit a quadriplegic. That was 1986, remember that date. Because 1986, as you'll see when we talk about this deck, was actually one of the big banner years for artificial intelligence. So in my life growing up, I became fascinated with how computers and technology could improve lives. My father's first wheelchair was a sip and puff where you blew air to move forward and backward. The doors in our house became automated so that he would be able to get through them. And by the time I was 15, our house was voice command so that he would be able to turn the thermostats up and down, things we take for granted every day right now. But that was rudimentary AI. So when I became a CISO, I was fascinated throughout my career with emerging technology. And one of the huge frustrations I had was that when dealing with mission critical crises, like, I don't know, DDoS attacks the night of Brexit, or the Olympic Games, or having um, human compromises in Brazil, my guys couldn't sort through the data fast enough. They couldn't get to the threat hunting fast enough. They couldn't get to the information they needed fast enough. 
And so, two years ago, I was in on a mission for the UK government in, of all places, San Diego. And I met a really weird guy by the name of Dave Atkinson, and he asked me for some advice on some what he called wicked business tech, and could I have breakfast with him. Worst hotel I've ever been in, in this falling down restaurant, if you can imagine, with like bad palm trees and like Hawaiian stuff swaying around. And he showed me this thing called Sensium. And what Sensium is, is a platform that, that utilizes unsupervised and supervised machine learning. So buzzword one, machine learning. And we utilize, oh, we are up, hold on. And we utilize proprietary patented artificial intelligence to mimic as close as possible what a threat hunter would do. We pause for thought, we look for action, we learn what we should be thinking about in environment. I love Dave's idea so much that I became an advisor for him for about eight months, and then took a really long walk off a short pier and incorporated the company in America a year ago. AI is a passion of mine. So today, one of the things I was thinking about was, could we actually utilize machine learning to build a talk about machine learning? Because while I'm really good at talking about AI and machine learning, there's a lot of people smarter than me. And we're up. Let's see. Don't BJ West. Well, now I just need to figure out how I'm supposed to do this. All right, you're smarter than me. Figure out what's going on. Uh oh. It says open display, open projector. It gives me this. Let's see. Hold on. Here. Hey, we got it. Woohoo! All right. So, I've been wondering whether or not I could give a talk utilizing machine learning. So, who is familiar with LinkedIn SlideShare? Anyone in this room? One person, two. Okay. So, as a really crazy, busy security person at Mommy of Four, when I want to learn about new topics quickly, this is my Bible. Why? Because anyone who's doing a presentation can jump anything they want on LinkedIn, and I can sort through anything and find lots of great information in really almost no time. But the machine learning aspect of it, if I type in what is AI, I get 1,137,000 different presentations to, to choose from, and I can pick and choose slides. So I spent about a week playing with machine learning to different, to different queries, look at different things, look at different authors I like, and start to build a profile of what type of information do I want to talk about. And then I started clipping slides. So I was able to build an entire talk on machine learning and AI from other people's work based on my actual preferences that were then learned through the machine that runs LinkedIn Slack. Kind of a fun thing. So, this is, and the only problem with it is because they have to attribute everybody's talk. You have to scroll through and set a regular slide. So bear with me, it's the first time I've done it, but I thought it was really cool. Isn't it amazing that I did an entire presentation using machine learning on artificial intelligence? I thought that was really cool. So artificial intelligence and machine learning. Who would agree with me raising hands? Those are probably the biggest buzzwords other than digital transformation in the industry today. Yeah, 100%. And you know what I really love is when I'm giving a presentation and I say my company is based on unsupervised and supervised machine learning, and by the way, we've patented AI, the eye rolls, like, oh my god, it's another one of you. It's amazing. But let's think about what is artificial intelligence. Well, for a lot of people, artificial, whoa, whoa hold on. That's my, there we go. Artificial intelligence, when we think about it, is this, right? The machines are going to take us over. We think about Terminator, we think about AI the movie, we think about sci-fi books. But the reality is, is that artificial intelligence is so much more than that. And it's driven on a human desire to do more. And the impact on it is something that we're highly debating. So I know you can't really read these names, but this I found really interesting. The biggest naysayers right now of artificial intelligence were, who just passed away, Stephen Hawking said it's going to destroy humanity. Bill Gates, very concerned about it. Who's on the fence? This can really surprise you. Elon Musk. Still really concerned a little bit. Thinks there needs to be a lot of ethics around it. Who's totally for it? This isn't going to surprise you. Mark Zuckerberg. Is that shocking? Absolutely not. 
But as a culture, we are in a huge philosophical debate about artificial intelligence. And the reason is, is that as a culture, we've lived by one fundamental truth. Knowledge is power. Right? More education is the one thing you can't ever, 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 ever have somebody take away from you. So what if machines are able to do that? And it's really given us a huge philosophical debate. And something as security practitioners that we need to be mindful of as we see this huge transformation in our industries of how computers are impacting our lives. One, can a machine really act intelligently? Can it solve a problem the way humans do? Two, is our intelligence the same? Is a brain a computer? Some would argue yes. Some would argue no. And three, can a machine have a mind, mental states, and consciousness? Consciousness being the key. Is that even possible? Who says yes? I would agree, I don't think so at this point. But could it be in the future? So the first time I ran into these philosophical questions, I will tell you I had a really rough time with it. I was at a conference in Daycon, Dayton, Ohio. I was sitting on a panel talking about women and security. The woman to the right of me was from Wright State. She helped with the original ARPANET and first educational internet, the most amazing women in the field. The woman sitting next to me was 19 years old. She had a top hat on, and she wore a mask. And I remember asking, well, what do you do? And she's like, well, I keep the top hat on to keep me grounded. But I'm doing my master's thesis in how to evoke empathy utilizing robots for warfare. <laughs> At 19. So we're going to create robots that we then feel sorry for so they can kill us. Great. And that's her master's thesis at 19. I was really glad she had a top hat and an mask on because I really didn't know what to think of it. But that was almost 10 years ago. Think about where we've come now. And that to me was the first time I really philosophically thought about what is artificial intelligence going to do to our world. There's a lot of hypotheses and different batter about what AI is, but the reality, AI is when machines exhibit intelligence, perceive their environment, and take action to maximize chances of success at a goal. And that's similar to what we say. Pause for thought, learn from experience, action accordingly. That's what sensing does. So very, very similar. So if we take it from that root angle, exhibit intelligence, perceive their environment, and take action, then really a cognitive computer is nothing more than something made with algorithms. Right? What's an algorithm? Math. Knowledge is only what's taught. Control is only what we give them control of and aware of nuances that can continue to learn. This, to me, makes it a lot more clear of what artificial intelligence is today than this mystic world of it's going to solve everything, right? But we are at the age of computers. So where did all this come from? Obviously, we have classical philosophers and sci-fi and computers are going to change the world. But the reality is that the idea of artificial intelligence came in the 1940s and was really speared by World War II. We have the Boleyn circuit model of the brain. We also have my favorite, the Enigma machine. Everyone seen? Yeah. So I'm old legacy British Telecom. I'm very proud of that fact that Bletchley Park, that was us. My first hacking team was actually called the Colossus, for those of the computer geeks in the room. But really, if you think about it, from World War II, the golden years were what? Landing a man on the moon, the space project. That was the beginnings of artificial intelligence. But then what happened? Think about that year. What did I say? 1986, year of my dad. It's also the year that we started to have a return of these networks to popularity, and we started to see applications in machine learning. Remember that sip and puff wheelchair I talked about? Very, very, very early machine learning. 1995 is when we started to see methods of vision language data. Again, because my dad was a vet and in a wheelchair. Guess what we had? All of those early precursors in my home, something I was immersed in on a daily basis. And now we think about later. We don't really think that facial recognition software has been around this long, since 2006. Robot driving cars, guess what? DARPA was playing with it in 2003. It's still a hotly debated topic almost 20 years later. And then, 2011 the first question answering robot. So I put this in because it's interesting. Elon Musk, 
think about this, said in 2011, AI singularity may kill us all. Think about what he's built his business on. And I would disagree that most people at that point in 2011 had a heavy skepticism of the singularity and that it took a lot of effort to get a little intelligence in something. But I think we've risen to the challenge because it's already impacting lots of parts of our lives. So we think about artificial intelligence from a security perspective, we sometimes forget that it's already embedded in everything we're working with and utilizing today. Think about the news that came with Apple last week. Siri's listening to everything, which always drives me crazy because sometimes I don't want advertisements for my kids' school shoes or God knows what, or the cutest little t-shirt because they're playing with my device, as I told you yesterday. Drones, Alexa, the butler of the future, self-driving cars, we utilize artificial intelligence constantly. But where else is it going to go, and how do we look at securing it? Guess what, guys? The machines are coming. Dun, 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 dun. So first thing, if you thought about a machine as a policeman, this is the cheetah robot. He can run 28 times faster than Usain Bolt and is being deployed as a test robot to actually utilize in crowds for crowd control. Amazing. Security guards. Nightscope security robots are being used in Uber parking lots at Uber headquarters. So instead of having a regular security guard, this guy's going to come and tell you you're parking illegally and then spit out a ticket, tape it to your window. How much fun is that? Builders. I love this one. A robot can construct a new home in two days. You mean I can have a new room as soon as I want one? Score! I don't have to deal with contractors in my house for weeks. I like it. And, guys, even, your pizza delivery guy. Domino's has the first drones delivering pizzas to customer homes. Robots are going to be everywhere. So it's our job in this room to do what? Protect the human, right? But what else could they do? Think about it. Really, how we can utilize AI is infinite. It could solve some of the world's greatest problems. But we all have challenges. So first thing we need to think about is how do we ensure the safety of the applications? If we have all this digital transformation, how do we start thinking about it safely? And this, how do we avoid unfair bias? If we're the ones making the algorithms, if we're the human is the person putting the controls on the computer, how do we make sure our own biases aren't translated into artificial intelligence? Next thing is <laughs> the law aspect of it. When the robot does something wrong, who's liable? Is it the end of privacy? So, funny story. Anyone here in this room know who Vint Cerf is? A couple people. For those who don't, Vint Cerf was actually one of the original founders of ARPANET. He is the internet evangelist of Google. He also, thankfully, has been my mentor since I was 21 years old. I got to carry his briefcase around for a couple of years. Um, and he said, privacy is extinct. It is an antiquated idea, much like the dinosaur. Now, in the UK, when I say that, they're like, yeah, we know that. Great. Privacy is gone. We say in the U.S. it's a very emotional response. I have privacy. What do you mean I don't have privacy? I gave a talk on it at RSA two years ago. The idea that privacy is extinct. Guess how many people showed up? One. My boss, he was pissed. <laughs> privacy is still something we have an emotional response to. So the idea that artificial intelligence and machine learning could be the end of it is something as Americans we really struggle with. And if that's the case, then when we struggle with something, what happens? The politicians get involved, and then what happens? Regulation, regulatory bodies. So how are we going to regulate the use of all these robots if we want more of them faster because digital transformation is the way of the world? And we can go to, ah, we've got a paradox going on. What else? Now we get into altruism. How will it benefit everyone? Not just the rich, but the poor, everybody. How can we make sure AI is there for everybody? How can it be ethical, accountable, transparent? This is a big concern. Will it eliminate jobs? Foxconn is going into Milwaukee, Wisconsin, U.S. headquarters. In China, 60,000 jobs were eliminated last year, $5 a day workers, because they were able to automate the process of utilizing artificial intelligence. So how do we reskill our workforces? 
to work with the robots and not lose jobs and not lose scope. And then how do we protect against the biggest problem, the unintended consequences? So this I just loved as I was playing through my slides. I love this quote. Every government, every company, every academic institution, every one of us should consider how AI will affect our future. But do we? No, we like our Alexas and everything else. So we should think about the trends. This is going to be hard to read, but there's four key trends right now. IoT security, talked about it a lot in this conference. How do we protect our supply chains? How do we protect those devices? Two, 600 new companies a year are being founded with the premise of artificial intelligence. we say that number again, 600 of them. The M&A activity is the hottest space in the industry. One trillion dollars will be spent in merger and acquisition of artificial intelligence in the next four years. One trillion dollars. Human monitoring. <laughs> Who thinks there's actually outsourcing of human monitoring technologies going on right now in this world? Yeah. I uh, was with um, former Secretary Nielsen not long ago, and she gave a big talk that it's actually one of the number one, this is really scary, sources of income for emerging countries in Asia to sell to former Eastern European countries. Social monitoring technologies. And then the worst thing is, guess what? We have all this artificial intelligence. Guess who's ahead of us in utilizing it? Not just China, the attackers. The hackers are way more sophisticated than we are right now in utilizing AI. So how are they doing it? Well, first of all, they like to attack AI systems. Why? Because it's really easy to fool an ML model. It's really easy to get someone something to believe that's a computer that doesn't have critical reasoning that you're an apple when you're really a banana. Or I use a lot of analogies about avocados and coconuts. That's a whole other speech about my avocado coconut security talk that you should listen to. It's really fun. But also physical attacks. And what I mean by physical attacks is if you're able to change what is on that screen, then you can provoke a different response. Think about the headlines last year that Uber could be used as a weapon of mass destruction. You change geophysical logic. You change the machine learning about where driverless taxis should go, or even real drivers. You could cause major damage in social warfare. So how does that work? Well, pretty easy example. Adversarial attacks. 57% say you've got a hand over here. You introduce just a little bit of static noise to that machine learning. Guess what? All of a sudden it says it's a monkey. That's how easy it is. Now think about that as we try and build more secure systems. If just static noise can change a pattern, think about the ramifications. From an attacker perspective, here's how hackers are utilizing AI today. They're utilizing AI to craft emails to bypass filters, mutate malware, execute machine speed, create attacks. Best example I had on this was I emailed myself last week. It was amazing to ask if I was in the office and was ready for a chat. Literally, I'm sitting on the phone and all of a sudden an email from me comes in. Two seconds later, an email from my partner comes in saying, hey, Kate, we have something mission critical. Could you quick text me at this number? Because they were trying to validate personal information. I was on the phone with my partner and I'm like, Dave, are you emailing me to text you right now? Did some forensics and there was one character off on the emails. Somebody was spoofing us. But it got through our systems because it looked close enough to what it should be. You know, I didn't catch it. Happens all the time. A good friend of mine, company, we talked about this yesterday, $500,000 bank transfer was rerouted based on being able to bypass the email filter. Easy peasy stuff, bread and butter. They actually, you can get services now, did you know this, on the App Store? The App Store for hackers, really, where they'll actually put SLAs around utilizing this for, for neglectful warfare and that kind of thing that they'll guarantee their hacks with an SLA. It's amazing. I don't even give an SLA on my service yet, but the hackers can. That's not good. This is, I think, the most concerning for me from a hacking perspective. AI power concealment. You can target the class concealment, the incident, and malicious intent, utilizing artificial intelligence. So if we aren't using AI on the opposite side to defend, how do we protect against this? How do we even start to think about this? They're ahead of us right now, guys. This is what's really interesting, though, is 
we talk about the emails and the malware, but when we talk about social distortion, social intent, we're starting to see the target of utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning to create havoc and create deception in the world go beyond our normal tradition thought. Audiovisual, physical, sensors, geolocation, user activity. Deepfake. Who here is familiar with deepfake? Yeah, lots. Okay, so I really played around with like a deepfake app the other day. I was able to make myself look like 15 pounds skinnier and have like really, really long brown hair. It was amazing. And then I was really worried so I had to delete the whole thing off my computer because it was making my computer do funny things in about five minutes. But it's starting to create this. Will AI manipulate us? And the answer is yes. Everybody remember this? This was the first picture that really started to bring the idea of manipulation into mainstream thought. Anyone not know what this is? Press intern at the White House was reaching for a microphone. The reporter went like this to say one more second. The photo was manipulated and it looked like the reporter actually hit the press intern and he was denied his badges. He was at his press badges taken away. Big incident, the president was involved. It was based on a manipulated photo. This is the actual real photo. Does it look like anyone was hit? No. But one manipulated photo caused thousands of press issues, thousands of problems, and almost one man's job. So if one little photo can do that, think about what the ramifications are. Here's the fake app I was telling you about. I didn't put my picture on, but here's one actress. Get to play around with what it looks like, pose, and then all of a sudden, you have really legitimate looking pictures on the other side that are very different from the original. It used to be that you needed lots and lots and lots of different facial expressions to be able to do videos. Guess how many you need wow, now? That's it, one. So this is even less than six months ago antiquated technology because now one photo is enough to build a reconstructed video. One. Think about the ramifications of our social footprints. Any one of us could be spoofed in a matter of seconds. So now that I've given you all this limit doom, we'll do one more limit doom. <laughs> Think about the algorithms themselves. Impersonation of trusted users. We just saw the, thing, the photo evidence of it. But nuances in behavior and writing style. Being able to really see crafting messages, blending into the background, faster attacks with consequences. Our social imprints are becoming the playground for how artificial intelligence can be used against us. And this is probably the most terrifying example. So there was a deep uh, fake video that came out leveraging a couple of tweets from the president. And it was basically a deep fake video saying that we were going to drop a nuclear bomb on North Korea. By leveraging our president's tweet profile, Spatial instructions, facial expressions, we were able to, there were hackers that were able to basically mimic what it would be like if he announced to the U.S. public that he was dropping them off. What if we didn't catch it? That's the kind of thing that how serious this could be. The last piece is this social control. China is already offering and selling social control technology. And while it gets more secure, the reality is, is that we're listening to it, and the AI is listening, and the social credit system is just the first step of true social control utilizing artificial intelligence. In China and other countries right now, if your social media makes it look like you are not pro-government, or there's things that are odd about you, people are being put into retraining camps. And that technology is being resold. That's how serious this is getting. So it's our job to figure out a couple of things. One, how do we educate how much personal information we're giving machines? Two, how do we safeguard more of the details about our behavior, our preferences, and our interests? And how can we improve how we interact with users to ensure that the safety and how we use AI is done in a really meaningful way? So let's remember one thing. The tool we're talking about is morally neutral. It's the application that matters. So AI and security. 
How can we use it? Well, a couple of things. It enforces integrity, it enforces privacy, and it prevents misuse. So just like I showed you all the things that hackers can do, we can do the same thing on the other side. So what are some of the ways we can use it? Well, here's the thing. If somebody's using AI for malicious activity, do you think we can use the same tools to detect it? Can we automate process for things like malware? 100%. Does it make it easier to respond to risk and free up time? That's the most critical thing. So it sends you, and I'll give you an example. So utilizing AI, the average company deals with, large company deals with 18,000 threat alerts a day. 18,000. Utilizing artificial intelligence, we are able to couple those into cases of potential attacks and different anomalies and things like that. We take it down to 42. Then we analyze further and able to discard out of that 42 down to eight that are actually potentially malicious and should be looked at. So think about that from a threat hunter perspective. 18,000 to 42 to eight. That's the power of artificial intelligence. Think about how much time you can give back. And the other thing is intelligent automation. Reduce the labor without the loss of quality. We have to work with the machines. Here's some of the applications that we're using right now for AI and cybersecurity, the cool ones I like. Automated fuzzing, clustering of malware, fraud detection, user authentication, account detection. Humans are pattern-based by nature. You go to the same websites, you use certificates in the same way. I'm always on my computer at one in the morning because I'm really weird and don't sleep a lot. Once in a while, I let my kids download crazy games like Pregnant Mermaid. Okay, maybe that's not a good example, but still. We have patterns. We can utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to understand the patterns of human behavior so that when somebody uses a valid certificate in an odd way, we can still catch it. Here's the ways we can make artificial intelligence our friend from a cyber perspective. Here's what it can't do. It's unable to detect new forms of malware, but it can detect when threat techniques are utilized in new forms of malware. That's critical. If we take it to the bones, we get to see it. If we try and do it when it's wholly baked, we're not going to understand it. Got to look at the bones, just like any forensic person. Two, it's never going to replace human experts. Three, there will never be a day of zero false positives. Well, as long as there is a creative person on the other side, there's going to be a problem. That's just the way it is. And my favorite is we will never solve all of the security problems. So I was walking down RSA a couple of years ago, and I was with the old CISO of Sony. We were walking, going to have coffee. We looked up, there was a billboard for a box, and the box said, by my solution, I will solve all your security problems. I was angry. What marketing person came up with, I'm going to solve everything for you? There is no box that's going to solve everything. There is no tool that's going to do it all. So any company that comes forward with artificial intelligence that can do it all, guess what, then they've never lived in our world. But here's the thing. Utilizing these tools, putting these into a production environment is scary for a lot of companies. I don't know if I want to trust the machines. I like my humans. I don't think it's ready. It's not ready for prime time. Change is scary. It's eternal, perpetual, and moral. Putting AI in your companies and in your security practices is a really fundamental shift that we have to make. So how do we start? Well, first of all, like I said, I love LinkedIn SlideShare because you get to see everybody who's egotistical and wants their slides up and every single thing. It's great to get a pulse on what the real industry is. But get familiar with it. Play with it. Find solutions you like. Look at, you know, even down to going on the floor at a black hat or an RSA. Look at the innovations. See what's going on out there. Read. It's fun. It's a really cool field. Then identify what in your industry could potentially be solved utilizing artificial intelligence. How could you simplify the stack? What solutions are coming up that you could potentially do something different with? Play with pilots. Every AI company I know is willing to do pilots. Play with the tech. Get familiar with it. Form a task force. Start small. Do not try and boil the ocean. Trust me, you will just have a headache and way too much data and see what you can do to incorporate it into daily tasks. And then remember, you gotta take responsibility for what you put in. Do you have a code of conduct around things? What do you value? What lines don't you want AI to cross in your organization? How do you make it transparent? And most importantly, 
How do you keep the humans in control? So that brings me to, I think, my final closing question, which is, what is human? What is human? What can a machine not ever do? Well, some would argue against this, but machines really aren't creative. They do what we tell us to do. They don't evoke empathy, or they're not empathetic yet. They can evoke it. Remember my hat, top hat girl? I really would love to know where she went. I've got to find her again. I want to see if she's still wearing top hats and doing empathy and robots. Are you wearing top hat? Awesome. We have a new top hat girl in the room. Critical thought. Humans are the only creatures that can truly think critically. And last but not least, I don't know any machine that can fall in love. You have to love what you do. And the fact that we all love security puts us one step ahead in understanding how we can harness the power of this technology. So my final question is, knowing all this, is knowledge really still power? Thank you. Of a LinkedIn. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Question. for them so that you know what we see is most malicious and the things that are low score that we thought were anomalous and we give access to the entire database. The thing we do is because we do have autonomous remediation, we're looking for like the ransomwares and the really big stuff because we block it and kill the connections immediately. But we do have the ability to show everything because you're right, there is that zero as much as you want to say zero threat, you also want to say zero trust in the sense that you don't want a machine doing everything. And ours will continue to learn over time to get better. Right, and that's, I mean, the one thing when I talk about artificial intelligence and my dad team and I talk about it all the time is there's a human developing and there's a human trying to break it. So it's a question of on both sides of the fence, which human is smarter that day. So you always want to be able to show and tie back all your data because there's always going to be things that get through, no matter what you're doing. That's just the reality of the situation we're in today. Yeah? So you would talk about all these uh, new emerging technologies, but my main question is, do you think it's going to take a catastrophic event for security to kick in or to mature? Define catastrophic event. An uh, event that takes human lives. So, I mean, the thing is, is that there's already catastrophic events. Um, I'll use the Exxon pipeline, um, Arkham's BP, actually, in 2016. It was a camera system that was compromised through the It was basically shadow IT. They didn't think about the camera systems. Um, a government sponsored hacking group got in a global pipeline. There's already those kinds of things. Um, the Uber example I gave. What they figured out was that um, with minimal, um, basically, issue, there was a, a gray hacker group that was able to hack into Uber. And, show how they would have been able to manipulate and get you know, 50,000 taxis or God knows however many in one specific location while um, a bomb was detonated in another part of the city. And all of the emergency vehicles would not have been able to get through. That kind of stuff already is available. So the thing is, is that from a security perspective, we need to raise awareness that it's a question of accepting the idea of security into our culture and be aware that it's there, that these issues, these catastrophic ideas are already there. They already can happen. We just need to stay one step ahead. We've already seen um, export controls placed on some technology back in the day. Uh, yep. It was uh, export controls on encryption to a certain constraint. Do you foresee possible export controls placed on AI? They already are. Yeah, so I mean, I have export control in my company. 
because we are to our I, our tax sits out of the UK. Yeah, there we are. Any other questions? Thank you for your time, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.